Good afternoon and good morning, good good evening, even wherever you are. I would like to uh, to welcome you to this joint webinar of the Asian Development Bank and the uh, and IMI. And I'm I'm really glad to uh, to introduce today the, the water, food, and energy, or the water, energy, and food uh, nexus that we'll be talking about. It's a, it's a relatively new concept. Although it has gotten enormous attention um, in the academics and in um, the development world as well, and there have been an enormous amount of publications in the in the last years. It's a bit seen as as a, as a new way of more practically looking at integrated water resources management, bringing everything together, but also having these energy and 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 food uh, food factors in it. So. Um, it's, it's very important also uh, for the Asian Development Bank. It's, it's one of the um, mentionings, one of the few mentionings of, of water, um, where we look at um, um, the importance of the water, uh, food and energy security as part of our operational priority three, which is on climate change and uh, sustainable environmental management. And uh, there is also in our corporate indicators on the on the outcome level a specific indicator for projects on how many sustainable water food security nexus solutions have be, been implemented. And uh, therefore, I'm, I'm very glad that today we're going to have a series of presentations on, on different aspects of this nexus. Uh, and we have a number of, of uh, very renowned speakers who have been looking into this from various different uh, viewpoints. We get a very interesting case study on Uzbekistan. So without uh, further ado, I would like to give the floor to uh, Jonathan Lautze, who is do doing the moderation today. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the seminar and have webinar and have many, many interesting questions and a good discussion. Uh, thank you, uh, Yele, for the for that framing. Um, and I think you started to bleed into some of the areas that I was going to introduce, which is which is great. Um, so yeah, so as, as he said, the, the focus of today is on the water energy food or in ADB lingo, it seems water food energy nexus, um, and some related issues that help support the nexus uh, and its implementation, namely, water accounting for water productivity and, and then IWRM. And, and we also feature a little bit of hydroeconomic modeling uh, related to hydro, uh, IWRM in this uh, discussion. So, so I am Jonathan Lautzi. I'm a research group leader at uh, the International Water Management Institute. And as, as Yele said, uh, I'm going to be moderating this session. You know, so let's see. Can I go on to the next slide? I hope you guys can see. So uh, to just take a brief step back, so this is the second of four uh, webinars in this series. As I understand, the broader aim of this series is to focus on innovative approaches and tools that advance water security and climate resilience. So, and, and then really it's, a, it's to drill down on that and, and, and push towards uh, concrete tools, practical examples that help us understand better what we mean by a set of issues that achieve the to contribute towards achieving water security, climate resilience. And the focus of today, as we said, is the, the water energy food nexus. Yale highlighted, I think, which is valid. It's a, it's a relatively new concept. It's getting towards a decade now, I guess, or a bit more than a decade that this concept has been around, but in broader terms in the water world, that's, that's still a little bit new. So what do we mean by the WEF nexus? And I wanted to review some of these, just briefly, some of these key concepts that we're gonna focus on today. You know, it was interesting. I was part of the uh, Asian Development Bank AWDO process, actually a couple times um, in, in 2010 to 2012 and then 2015, 16. We actually looked at the WEF uh, in, in, as part of those process and tried to measure it. But we focused mainly on outcomes, just if achieving WEF nexus was good outcomes in water, energy, food. So, it's, so but WEF is more than that. It's actually about finding efficiencies in the system, in the process, so that you have positive outcomes, but you have a positive and efficient process across sectors to achieve those outcomes. So, so in effect, that's, that's what we mean by WEF or WFE, whichever way you want to cut it, with a WEF nexus. Some of the other issues we want to talk about today, to achieve the WEF nexus, it's important to account for water. Um, so what does that mean practically? You can do water accounting, apply water accounting tools to achieve pro productive water use across a range of sectors. You know, what is water accounting? It's a process of capturing and communicating 
uh, water uses in different sectors. And then IWM, IWM is a, is, is a word that's thrown around so much that there's danger that it loses, loses a bit of its meaning. You know, I put a simple definition under there and tried to underline some of the key words in, in, in that concept, which is coordinated development and management. So it's about coordinating, not just focusing on, on, on sort of management without engagement, it's, but it's coupling management with engagement with stakeholders so that their preferences are incorporated into a, a process for deciding on how to manage water. So ultimately that can help uh, realize the WEF nexus in the most positive way. So, so um, in short, those are three areas that we're going to focus on uh, today. To drill a bit more and introduce some of the speakers that are going to provide examples or, or tools today uh, and, and the, you know, highlight the locations that they're going to focus on. So the first of three presenters today is going to be Kahraman Jumobayev, uh, who's a researcher in our Uzbekistan office, and you heard Yele refer to that earlier. And it's one of our real highlights at EMI is, is where he fostered uh, application of the WEF Nexus uh, in lift irrigation in Uzbekistan in the Amu Darya, uh, where it's basically very much directly addressing an in inefficiency in the system, and then ultimately through that arriving at a basically more positive outcomes across sectors. It was one of our real achievements at EMI. In addition, uh, Lisa Maria Ravello, uh, who's based in our headquarters, who's a principal researcher based in our headquarters, um, will talk about using water accounting uh, to generate options for more productive water use in a sub-basin of the Nile in East Africa. Uh, yeah, and I should say, I think from what I gathered, Lisa is, is known to uh, some of the people that may be involved in this uh, webinar. I think she's uh, implemented some ADB projects, and so some of this may not be entirely new to you. But in any case, um, she's going to focus on understanding how an infrastructure investment will alter water use and availability in water energy, energy food sectors, so that by understanding some of uh, these alterations, you can uh, cope and manage and uh, manage them best, both, both in, in the particular sectors and then across. And then last, Luna Barati, who's based in Germany, uh, she's a principal uh, researcher there. We'll focus on fostering adoption of models by using IDBRM platforms in, in Western Nepal. So basically, she focus, she's going to focus on how WEF scenarios were developed in conjunction with stakeholders. So it should say co-developed. And then ultimately, these were these there was this led their incorporation into planning in Western Nepal. So following that, we're going to allocate around 12 to 15 minutes uh, on each of those presentations. There will be a minute or two for clarifying questions, but deeper questions will wait until uh, a discussion portion at the end. So after those three presentations, we'll move into uh, a discussion uh, where you can ask deeper questions about the nature of WEF and other things. Uh, and then uh, Stefan Ullenbrook, who's a strategic program director at EMI and Water Food Ecosystems, will synthesize some of the key threads that are emerging from the discussion, and then we'll hand it back to Yele uh, to close out the session. Before I pass it on to uh, Kahramon to kick things off with one of the, the case studies from, um, uh, from Uzbekistan, uh, I just wanted to say in terms of the way questions are posed, uh, we prefer people just go ahead and shoot them straight uh, into the chat box, and then we'll pick them up. And you know, and I'll, that'll be me actually as moderator. I'll I'll pass the clarifying ones on immediately after the presentations, but the deeper ones, those will come up uh, in the Q and A. We prefer to reserve uh, the voice for only when there's something that really needs uh, clarification, kind of in a really exceptional case, just to move things along efficiently. Okay, so with that, again, thanks for uh, attending. Hopefully we have some good presentations and a good uh, discussion. I think I'll hand it over to uh, Kahraman. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for introduction. Today, I will talk about improving water energy use efficiency in the lift irrigated areas of Uzbekistan. And uh, irrigated agriculture plays important role in the economy of Uzbekistan, and uh, it provides 30 percent of overall GDP and employs 27 percent of rural population, and also it provides you know 25 percent of all export revenues. And uh, due to semi-arid climate, 97 percent of crop production is cultivated in irrigated areas. There is uh, in Uzbekistan 4.3 million hectares of irrigated area and more than 50% of this area under lift irrigation or under pump irrigation. So lift irrigated area consumes about 20% of total available energy of the country and government allocates annually 
from 70 point, 7.5 to 8.5 billion uh, kilowatt hour electricity for pump operations. And uh, it also, you know, as, uh, government also subsidizes electricity uh, in uh, pump irrigated areas and spends around 450 million uh, USD annually. So uh, one, uh, 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 nowadays there is emerging a lot of challenges in irrigated agriculture due to climate change, to population growth, and there is increasing competition for water and energy, and uh, there is also increasing demand for food production. According to climate scenarios, uh, 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 Amudaria river flow uh, might be reduced by 15% by 2050, and uh, Sildaria river uh, uh, flow uh, will be reduced by 5%. And another challenge is that farmers still use uh, conventional traditional irrigation practices which is inefficient and leads to excess drainage water runoff. And inefficient irrigation practices have led to water losses and caused excessive consumption of energy by outdated pumpers. And this is also, you know, huge consumption of lift uh, irrigated area, uh, energy consumption, you know, uh, also constraints, you know, limits transmission of energy to other sectors of economy. Here on the right side, there is depicted lift irrigation scheme Kashkada, in the Kashkadaria region. You know, you can see here uh, Amudaria River Basin and uh, Amudaria River. And here water is pumped from river through several pump cascades to lift irrigated area. This area is total 335,000 hectare area, home for 1.7 million rural population and also uh, you know, uh, uh, this area is a very, very high energy and water intensive uh, area. <laughs> and another issue in lift irrigated area, because of inefficient irrigation practices, there is also a uh, uh, huge runoff and also uh, this runoff accumulated as a collector, uh, accumulated in collector drainage system and again transmitted back to the uh, uh, Amudaria River. You can see how much you know uh, water is polluted due to uh, runoff from lift irrigated uh, irrigation schemes. In order to understand, you know, this water, energy, food, and also environmental issues, you know, it's uh, very complex. And uh, uh, in in order to see uh, these issues holistic way, you know, in order to understand and to find out uh, interdependence between these uh, three systems, you know, WebNexus helps us, you know, uh, to make proper decision and to develop sustainable strategies. And uh, we know that, you know, we need water for irrigation. We know that we, uh, we need water for uh, hydropower development. We need also water for uh, other purposes, for drinking, and also we need energy for pumping up water and also we need energy for desalinization of uh, saline water. Therefore, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's important to understand interlinks, uh, interlinkages between these three systems, you know, interdependencies and uh, so that uh, uh, among these three systems and how to ensure water, energy, food security for growing population. And with Nexus helps us, you know, to identify uh, trade-offs, manage trade-offs, and to build synergies, allowing for more integrated, cost-effective uh, planning and decision making. Uh, we have also reviewed several uh, literature papers, and there is very limited, you know, application of with Nexus in the development projects in the region, and also there is uh, less quantitative uh, tools applied in order to uh, analyze WebNexus benefits. And uh, uh, within framework of uh, USID peer project uh, in Central Asia, uh, we have studied, you know, we try to operationalize WebNexus in the lift irrigated schemes. In, and we try to analyze, you know, issues uh, using lens of WebNexus. And we partnered with uh, 
ministries, uh, basin water management organizations, water user associations in the region, and farmers. And uh, <clears throat> under this project, we had plan. You know, we have objective to create geodatabase to estimate water energy use efficiency. Maybe you have heard that Central Asia is data limited country. In order to conduct, you know, with Nexus analysis, we need some field data. Uh, and also remote sensing uh, data uh, uh, for uh, making good analysis. And we also documented best practices of farmers on water land management uh, implemented in the region and also other parts of the world in order to develop different scenarios. For example, if we improve uh, irrig uh, uh, existing irrigation practices what would be implication for water saving and energy saving, and also assess the uh, potential improvements for this lift irrigation scheme, and at the end, you know, provide policy recommendations for key stakeholders, decision makers uh, in the region. So this is a geo database created by my colleagues here. We have a good GIS specialist Zafar, so he created this geo database, you know, which uh, comprises different. Uh, thematic maps, including water resources, climate data, soil, land classification, and et cetera. And we have also documented best practices from India, from USA, and also from Central Asian countries, which could be, uh, you know, applied to uh, lift irrigation, irrigation scheme in order to improve water energy use efficiency. And I would like to mention that we have also demonstrated drip irrigation, gated pipe irrigation, in the project study area in order to show them, you know, there is the potential for improvement of water energy use efficiency in the lift irrigated area. And we have used this methodology in order to develop different scenarios. So I will skip uh, uh, detailed explanation due to time limit. And uh, this is the one of the scenario which we have developed for uh, Karshi step and uh, our Results indicated that you know if we improve, uh, if we shift from uh, current practices to improving improved irrigation practices, we can uh, significantly save uh, water in the lift irrigated scheme, uh, uh, which is 575 uh, million cubic meter of water, 259 gigawatt hour electricity, and also we have calculated carbon emissions because in Uzbekistan, more than 80% of energy is generated using coal and natural gas. And uh, our results indicated that, you know, we can significantly reduce water and energy saving also reduce carbon emissions in the uh, lift irrigated area if we improve irrigation efficiency. So, uh, <coughs> and uh, we have uh, engaged in, uh, we have documented all this uh, evidences and synthesize it, and we also engage it with key policy makers uh, through organizing policy dialogue workshops. And uh, we uh, indicated that current government policies on en energy subsidy in the lift irrigated area do not support water energy saving in Uzbekistan. Therefore, if the government shifts the subsidies from energy to water saving technologies, it will improve water energy use efficiency, and our research the findings indicated that, you know, we can reduce significantly water in lift irrigated areas, you know, by 30% uh, water uh, uh, use, 30% energy use, and also uh, we can reduce carbon emissions. And of course, there is also, we indicated to the government officials that there is need some institutions and policies so that farmers adopt, you know, uh, improved irrigation practices in order to improve water energy use efficiency. And uh, uh, we also were able to influence policy change within framework of this project. And uh, uh, the results demonstrated that multiple benefits of promoting new irrigation technologies in lift irrigated areas were communicated to stakeholders, starting from presidential administration to key line ministries, Minister of Economy and Minister of Water Resources. And uh, we have all our research findings also contributed to the expansion of lift uh, uh, water saving technologies in Uzbekistan. Uh, and government now is covering up 50% of drip irrigation costs if farmer adopts uh, drip irrigation or 
uh, other water saving technologies. And also farmers will be exempted from land tax for five years. And uh, recently there is new decree came, presidential re resolution, and uh, which, uh, uh, you know, oversees that, you know, expansion of uh, drip irrigated area and the sprinkler irrigation area in Uzbekistan up to 450,000 hectare area, uh, area in 2021. And uh, I personally uh, uh, contributed uh, to the development of uh, this strategy. And uh, EMIS, uh, you know, uh, contribution is widely acknowledged in mass media. And uh, this is the publications which we have prepared within framework of this project. In concluding uh, remarks, I would like to emphasize that we have studied, you know, uh, water energy food nexus, uh, you know, in the lift irrigation scheme at the national level, at the sub basal level. But uh, this can be also expanded, you know, transboundary uh, rivers of Central Asian countries because uh, nowadays there is growing competition for water use and energy use in Amudaria and uh, Sildaria river basin. So this kind of best practices, this kind of tools can be easily, you know, replicated to larger basins and, uh, and it, will, uh, will, it will give, you know, very much, uh, it will be helpful, you know, for governments of Central Asian countries, you know, to make decisions on water and energy use efficiently uh, and sustainable way in transboundary context. Thank you. Uh, if there will be any questions for clarifications, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Kahraman, thanks, thanks for the presentation. And uh, noted, I like the final point a lot on the transboundary, uh, you know, how scaling up to transboundary and has, has come up through different discussions that raises issues around data. And that's where something like water accounting can, can come in, which, um, which we're going to hear from next. But before we move on um, to the next presentation, there are a couple of clarifiers in there in the chat box. Um, so, and in, in it's not necessarily on core aspects of your presentation, but more, I think, on the, the background. Uh, some of the data uh, that you presented on uh, the contribution of agriculture to GDP, uh, there is somebody that was questioning whether that's 18% rather than 30%. Um, and then there's also some a question around, I think, a, again, a relatively background point um, around the kind of trends in flow in the Amu Darya. Is it going to increase by mid-century or due to glacial melt or is it going to decrease? Uh, do you want to offer any thoughts on those two kind of background mm -hmm. points? Uh, actually, according to uh, uh, World Bank study, uh, in Amu Darya river basin, river flow might be reduced by 2050 by 15%. Uh, this is due to, you know, uh, <clears throat> less rainfall, due to glaciers melt, and uh, our hydrometers also studied that from 1945 up to 2000, we have already lost, you know, almost 40% of our glaciers in mountain areas. And regarding second question uh, related to the uh, uh, role of agriculture uh, in terms of contribution to GDP, Yes, uh, there are uh, different numbers, but uh, this number uh, I have received from Minister of Agriculture and Water Resources. Uh, last year, actually, Minister of Agriculture and Water Resources together with IFPRI organized policy dialogue workshop in Tashkent. So then uh, the, the, there was different numbers, but uh, at the end, you know, Ministry of Agriculture and Water, uh, Minister of Agriculture of Uzbekistan mentioned that, you know, it's uh, around 30 percent, you know, role of uh, agriculture in GDP of Uzbekistan. Yeah, good. Okay, there's there's other questions flowing in, but we're going to reserve those for the for the discussion portion uh, later after after the following two presentations. So thanks thanks a lot, Kahraman. You can maybe have a look at those on on the chat box, and when we get to the discussion, we can address those ones. In the meantime, then I guess we can hand over to uh, Lisa to discuss water accounting and the water accounting uh, case study in a sub basin of East Africa. Uh, and how that can be a tool to help us achieve better implementation of the WEF Nexus. Lisa, do you want to go ahead? So in this next presentation, I'm going to look at how we can provide um, information needed to start a dialogue around um, allocation, in particular in situations 
where data on abstraction or in situ monitoring networks might not be available. So water productivity is a concept uh, which describes the value or benefit derived from the use of water. And it can be applied at different scales. So at the field to irrigation scheme scale, for example, it can be used as a performance indicator for monitoring, evaluating, or diagnosing irrigation uh, water management. But to fully capture the benefits of improved water productivity at the scheme level, it's necessary to integrate assessments at the basin um, level. And so assessing the productive use of water forms the basis for IMI's water accounting approach. Water accounting is usually defined as a systematic and quantitative assessment of the status and trends in water supply, demand, distribution, and use in a specified domain, producing information that informs water management and governance to support sustainable development outcomes. And quantifying and understanding the available water resources is really at the heart of defining an IWRM or a WFE strategy. It shouldn't also be a one-off exercise, but as Jonathan mentioned in the beginning, it's a dynamic, it's all about the dynamic interactions. So it should be as a process that should be undertaken on a regular basis. But in many countries, water accounting and encompassing any approach which really facilitates regular reporting on water resources at, for example, the basin scale, is not common practice. And this is often due to the lack of data or the difficulty in accessing any existing data sets. So Water Accounting Plus is a specific framework uh, which IMI has worked with and is an approach which addresses this. So the approach was conceptualized by IMI in partnership with IHE Delft and FAO as a new framework that uses the IMI water accounting principles which were developed in the mid 90s of tracking water depletions, the water that's actually consumed rather than withdrawals. And it really acknowledges that data sets on withdrawals are typically scarce or unavailable or incomplete both at the basin scale and locally by water use sectors. And so instead by quantifying the water consumed and using data from earth observation satellites, we can address this information gap. So as you see on the slide here, there's three main components to the approach. It consists of a set of open source methodologies, which is applied to a range of open access global data sets, um, mostly remote sensing, but also from other sources, to compute the water balance and to derive further related indicators, which provide a summary of water resource use and sustainability for a particular location over a given period of time. So for the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to focus on an example where the approach was used to support the design of particular water resources investment and to inform opportunities to improve the productive use of water across the basin. So this, this is a basin in East Africa. It's a small transboundary basin shared by two countries as a distinct wet and dry season, and it contains an ecologically and economically significant ecosystem. There's a huge amount and increasingly so of unsustainable farming uh, practice, practices. There's a high population growth rate and the situation is being exacerbated by a changing climate. So the investment project involves a multi-purpose facility with a dam and a reservoir, um, including provision for domestic supply, irrigation and livestock. And it's part of a much broader and ambitious investment portfolio. But conflict already exists between sectors and energy resources uh, in particular are limited within the basin. So we've used the Water Accounting Plus approach here to assess the availability of water for the proposed investment and to inform water allocation plans. So using Water Accounting Plus, we calculate the key water balance parameters over a 15 year time period using a, a range of remote sensing data sets. So this slide summarizes the water balance results for the basin. And on the left, you have the mean annual um, water balance over a 15 year time period from 2003 to 2018. And on the right for a dry season, sorry, the, an average, the average dry season data. So on the left in the annual, um, in, the an, in the annual image, we can see that the total annual precipitation, the blue arrow coming in, was 14.3 kilometers cubed. All the units are in kilometers cubed per year. And of this, on the left, from the orange arrow, we see leaving the system, 64% uh, was consumed as evapotranspiration. We can partition the evapotranspiration uh, based on the source. So most of the CT is due to rainfall on the left in the green arrow, 87%, and a small proportion due to other sources, 13%. Um, irrigation, for example. 
So under average rainfall conditions on the left, an estimated 1.3 kilometers cubed representing the combined surface groundwater and soil moisture storage was replenished back into the system. In contrast, on the right, we have the dry season picture where average precipitation coming into the system, the blue arrow at the top is 2.9 kilometers cubed and total ET leaving the system on uh, the orange arrow uh, constitutes 79% of the precipitation. So as would be expected, much higher than it in during the wet season. In the dry season, a higher proportion of the ET comes from sources other than rainfall and water is taken out of storage. The outflows are also low. So the ET is the largest flux and can be examined further for each land use type. And this is really the strength of an approach such as Water Accounting Plus because the data is spatial. So as well as examining it um, spatially across each of the different land use types, uh, it can also be partitioned, partitioned into productive and non-productive use. So we partition the evapotranspiration based on the evaporated and the transpired components to see how much of the water use is going towards a productive use, so the production of, of vegetation of agriculture in this case. In this particular basin, the primary consumer of water is agriculture, accounting for 41% of the total evapotranspiration. And of that, rain-fed agriculture consumes 93%. Of that 93, 93%, 62% is lost to ET from bare soil surfaces, meaning that the rain-fed agriculture is not using water productively. So quantifying the seasonal water balance over the 15-year time period also enables us to look at the interannual variability, and that's what you see here on this slide. So you have the total annual wet season flows and fluxes on the left, uh, the precipitation in light blue, the outflow um, in yellow, and the evapotranspiration in orange as well as the change in storage in the dark. And on the right, you have the dry season. In the wet season on the left, we have higher precipitation, evapotranspiration and outflow. And as would be expected, precipitation is greater than ET in the wet. Precipitation is lower in the dry season and ET is high. In the wet season, water is typically put into storage, while in the dry season, it is often taken out of storage. So in order to assess the proposed allocation in the wider basin and downstream context, we need to take into account any downstream commitments, both legal and non-legal, environmental flows, for example, as well as, as well as downstream abstractions. So Water Accounting Plus incorporates the indicators and measurements needed to do this. The approach goes beyond a water balance assessment and the standard indicators which I presented in the previous slides to understand when and how the water is being used across the landscape and who are the main users. So the more detailed analysis is presented as a water account, which partitions each of those water balance parameters further in order to quantify what proportion remains for further allocation. So I have just a few of the key indicators presented in this table. We have the exploitable water, which is the quantity in the system which is available for exploitation. We have the reserve flows. These are the surface water flows, which have been reserved as part of a sharing agreement with a downstream country in the case of transboundary basins or a portion of the water in the lake or river that needs to be left to ensure the health um, of the local ecosystem, which is um, significant in this case. And utilized flow, which is the portion that is depleted and not available for further use. And finally, the utilizable outflow, which is the quantity of water, which is available for additional water resources development. Now in this table, I just show um, a series of the annual outputs. We also produce them uh, for the wet season and the dry season as the extremes and, and the variability are both important. So I'll now look at these in more detail against the proposed abstractions. So there are, three, there are three irrigation scenarios which we selected from the project design document for this purpose. And these involve different cropping systems and size of command area. The project was envisaged to develop net irrigated agriculture of approximately 8,340 hectares and paddy rice on the full area was the preference. The alternatives were presented as low demand scenarios. So I'll focus on this and that's the light green line um, on the graph, the high demand scenario and the preference in this case. So we added in the additional abstractions for the domestic supply as well as the estimated annual ET um, from the reservoir based on the remote sensing analysis. So on the two graphs, the red line is the proposed monthly abstraction and the light blue line is the mean monthly utilizable flow. So the quantity of water which is available for additional water resources development across the basin. So on the left um, graph, the average that shows the average over the 15 year time series. And on the right is the 2005 uh, data, which is an extreme dry season. So the peaks 
are the wet season, which, sorry, I don't, can't seem to get my point all working, but the peaks are from March uh, until May, that's the wet season. And then we go into a dry season from June to October, and then another short wet season, November, December. So considering the wet season months, March to, March to May and November to December, there are sufficient resources to fill the reservoir um, in both the average um, data and the extreme dry season. But on average across the past 15 years, the utilizable flow, the blue line, is only marginal, marginally higher than the irrigation demand, the red line, in the first half of the dry season, so June to September, October. And it is clear why the reservoir is needed to support irrigation. Considering the extreme dry season water availability, the graph uh, on the right, during this very dry year, the demand is greater than the utilizable flow. And in fact, there are no utilizable flows during several months of the year from June onwards. And without storage, any demand would have to be met through groundwater extraction. In particular for this year, environmental flows are not met during September to November. What is the overall picture um, in this example? Well, water is available for allocation, but mostly in the wet season. During the dry season, most of the available water is utilized. The consistent and reliable supply of dry season flows would require measures that would store water during the wet season to be made available during the dry season. This suggests that while the current uh, water allocation plans can be used as guidance for water use permits, future projects need to carefully can be considered before issuance and water use needs to be regularly monitored. Given the scarcity of water and the extreme variability due to uh, during the dry season, food security could be improved considerably through an expansion of irrigated agriculture, where water use is managed during the dry season, as well as through more productive use of the available water for agriculture during the wet season, so the rain-fed cropping systems. The peaks in irrigation demand during the dry season months of the year coincide, coincide with the extreme low river flows, resulting in the need for seasonal storage. So the investment project will be, ex will be impacted by these extreme dry seasons. The results indicate that the total abstraction requirement for the project is satisfied for most of the seasons uh, during the 15 year time series analyzed, but not the extreme dry periods as, as in the one I, I showed. This translated into reliability rate of 73% over the 15 year period. So to conclude with a few key messages, as in many other basins, there's an increasing demand for water, food, energy, and infrastructure development. Resource use and potential trade-offs have only been assessed through simulations in this current case due to the lack of in-situ data. But by systematically acquiring, analyzing, and communicating information related to water resources, water accounting can and is critical to assist in developing a common understanding of the state of the water resources. So using the approach that I presented, the remote sensing data are used to generate quantitative information and maps on major storage flows and fluxes of water resources within a river basin. This information is critical to ensure all major water demands can be sustainably met, including for agriculture, domestic energy, and environmental purposes. And by providing a landscape-based assessment of water availability and use, it provides the context for the development of a WFE strategy and the information needed to optimize allocation um, while maximizing water productivity. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Lisa, for that presentation. That was good to contextualize WEF in the in the context of uh, you know changing water resource availability. Okay, ju I'm just look just scrolling through the chats and maybe just one or two clarifiers there. You know, I think there's first off, there's one dis briefly describe how you derived your water balance component, precipitation, water storage, and and ET. That might be one that could be quick. And then uh, there was another question around I think some of the the different products and whether there's bias there in different remote sensing products. If, if you offered any comment on that quickly, I think that'd be good as well. Thanks. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, so the water balance is derived using a standard water balance equation where we solve for the change in storage over time and the precipitation and the inflows. Um, the precipitation comes from remote sensing data. We typically use CHIRPS data. Um, and the ET uh, is also remote sensing based uh, depending on the location from one of a variety of ET projects. Uh, uh, products. In terms of the biases, yes, that is always an issue when using remote sensing data. And we do, um, first of all, we do an assessment of the different uh, products against any in situ data which we're able to access um, to select the most appropriate. Um, but the emphasis really of this approach is that the biases will be consistent because we'll use the same, um, the same data across borders and across basins. So 
um, it's, it's really a starting a point. It's a starting point to start the, to begin the discussion around water allocation and opportunities for improved uh, productivity while acknowledging that those biases there and that there are still uncertainties in the data. Yeah, okay, good. And I saw Yusuf uh, kind of pop up like he wanted to say something, but uh, Yusuf, I think we can put that on hold and then we can come back to this in the discussion later uh, if you like. But I think it's good. And so I, I wanna keep it moving here to ensure we have some time for the, um, for the discussion in about 15 minutes. So there, as, as highlighted at the outset of this uh, webinar, there's one more presentation and it's focused around IWM and uh, using in kind of coupling IWM uh, and stakeholder engagement with hydroeconomic modeling to inform uh, WEF planning in Western Nepal. And Luna Bharati is gonna make that presentation. And so um, Luna, if uh, you're ready, we can hand over to you and uh, you have uh, 12 to 15 minutes. Okay, so before we go into uh, the WEF Nexus, and um, I will also be uh, giving a presentation uh, talking about a case study from Nepal. But before we move into that, um, with WEF Nexus, we're trying to achieve multiple objectives. So uh, this is a figure I took from, it's adapted from Julian Harrow's uh, paper from 2014. So uh, water resources planning um, uh, should ideally meet demands and achieve various societal objectives. So it should be balanced uh, under a wide range of possible uh, plausible futures. So the risks brought on by climate change, but also other future pressures. Uh, but the main challenge here is to come up with the shared vision to develop a base in our country that is both robust and balanced. And so this is where, uh, you know, the implementation of the WEF Nexus approach becomes a problem. So just to give a reminder, we talk about water, energy, food. There are also additional sectoral water demands like uh, mining, major cities, uh, industry, domestic water use that also comes into the mix. Moving on to the case study from Nepal. So water resources, um, I mean, I just wanted to give the context, the Nepal context. So water resources um, remain very underdeveloped. Um, less than 7% of available water resources are managed for socioeconomic purposes. Um, this figure might have gone up by a couple of percentages. This is 2005, but it's still very low. 2.5% of economically feasible hydropower potential is harnessed. 30% uh, of arable land is irrigated. 22% of groundwater is utilized in the Terai. Uh, crop productivity is still lower than the rest of South Asia. And this integrated planning, which we all try to promote so much, is not really um, implemented or it's not, uh, uh, yeah, it's not implemented. Uh, however, the general opinion is that if water resources is properly harnessed, it would be the ticket out of poverty through economic growth, hydropower uh, development, and the access. So, yeah, so what tools are developed? Basically, before I go into the tools, the main goal of the project was to promote sustainable water resources development in Western Nepal through balancing future vision, economic growth, social justice, and healthy, resilient ecosystems. We developed two hydrological models. Um, um, here we developed the SWAT model for the Karnali and Mona um, sub, uh, basins, as well as the Makai, so two river basins in Nepal. And the SWAT is a process-based model. Climate future matrices were developed based on projections from 19 RCMs, so regional climate models. A hydroeconomic model was also developed for the basin. So I'll go a little, yeah, I lost a little bit of time in the beginning, so I hope I can... Um, a little bit over, um, but yes, I'll try to put, talk as quickly as possible. So, okay, so the approach is we develop these hydrological um, models, hydroeconomic models, uh, you know, included a climate change analysis. But what we also did was throughout the whole um, uh, assessment, we engaged with stakeholders. So we had two, so 255 stakeholders were engaged over six events. We had a large 
recent survey of over uh, you know almost 5,000 households and 121 expert interviews, and their opinions also incorporated in the whole model setup as scenarios. And I'll show you this later. Just a brief description of our results from the hydrological model. From the top, you see spatial um, distribution of the water balance components, you know, precipitation, ET, water yields. Uh, in the bottom graph, you see a temporal distribution of the uh, you know, uh, water balance components. And uh, as you can see, uh, in, as in most of Asia or South Asia, it's a very monsoon driven system. Over 80% of precipitation falls during the monsoon months of June, July, August, and September. With climate change, we um, found increases in precipitation, and these show annual figures. And the increases in uh, temperature are higher than the global Paris Agreement target of 1.5 degrees C. But we also did a, did a seasonal analysis and found uh, temperature to increase, especially in winter and pre monsoon seasons. With precipitation, um, when we look at these average values, we show that they're increasing. But uh, if you look at the spatial interpolation, you find areas where there's precipitation decrease and areas where precipitation increase. Now moving on to our hydroeconomic model. So we took the output of the hydrology model, the climate change analysis, and we built this hydroeconomic model. And this is where we then incorporate the WEF uh, approach. So the modules in the hydroeconomic model included the environment, agriculture, energy, industrial and municipal. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, the stakeholder consultation process, with the stakeholder consultation process, then we came up with future development pathways. And um, we had visioning exercises at the national level, at local level, disag gender disaggregated, et cetera. And so we, we basically aggregated them and came up with three development pathways large infrastructure development, locally managed development, and preserving ecosystem integrity. So with a large, um, a large you know, infrastructure development, this would be then national state-led development with large infrastructure. The objective is domestic energy use, energy export, excess energy generation, centrally managed grid expansion, and the complementary investments include transport, communication, health, education. The locally managed development or the second scenario, this is more of a bottom-up approach. And so here we have community managed hydropower, small scale infrastructure, farm managed irrigation, municipal water supply, and the uh, management scenarios are also at local and the localized costs and benefits. And the third one is preserving ecosystem integrity. So here it's central policies, local enforcement. The objective is ecotourism, species preservation, maintaining natural flows. And so it's basically to leverage natural assets to meet energy and food production. And so I just have one, uh, okay, so um, when we talk about nexus, and we're focused quite a lot on the synergies, but there will also be trade-offs. For example, uh, an example of synergy we found for hydropower and irrigation development, there was basically a lot of energy, so you increase, uh, you know, you can increase both, and they benefit each other. However, uh, environmental um, integrity, if you want, if that is your main focus, then of course there is um, a more stringent environmental flow than reducing energy production. So we quantified those as well. One other example of trade-off we found was energy for domestic demands and export and transboundary flows. Would There would be trade-off for um, water available for agricultural, local agricultural production actually from the Terai of the lower area. So this graph um, basically shows, you see three bar graphs. So one is status quo, where in the left you see hydropower production, the right agricultural production. So in hydropower production, 
Currently, there is hardly any hydropower production in these basins, very little ag production. If we go for um, scenario one, development pathway one, with full infrastructure development, of course, your hydropower goes up, agriculture also goes up. With the limited infrastructure, which is more the small scale uh, development pathway, less um, uh, energy production, but agriculture was more or less the same. But here in this um, in this scenario, the ecosystem, the eco environmental flows were preserved. And so uptake and impact. So uh, the, we were able to read um, impact or achieve impact with this project in that the Department of Irrigation, they took our hydrological models to develop the National Irrigation Master Plan. And this actually was supported by ADB. So not just our models from the Karnali, but also from previous three river basin models that we, were, we had developed have been used to develop the National Irrigation Master Plan. The environmental flow assessment has also been mentioned in the Irrigation Master Plan. And all the models as well as data are in our project website. And I mentioned these two here. Um, Okay, so takeaway messages. I'm in my last slide now. So the hydrological models such as SWAT can be very useful in quantifying spatial and temporal water availability and distribution, as well as the impact of climate change. The, through coupled hydroeconomic models to evaluate the impacts of various water use scenarios and development pathways, uh, we can visualize water energy, uh, food synergies, as well as trade-offs. And so accompanying modeling activities with stakeholder engagement processes, it supports ownership and it promotes uptake and impact. So thank you very much. Oh yeah, these are just a list of some of our publications. But if you go to the um, link there, our project website is there with a lot more publications. We were very productive in this. Uh, individual project. And thank you very much. And I'm very sorry for taking up too much time because there was a technical glitch at the beginning. Yeah, th thanks a lot, Luna. No, you actually kept relatively two times. So uh, good, good for you. That was good. Um, so in terms of clarifiers, uh, not so many, but there is a question or two around uh, environmental flows. Um, is it mandatory to do e-flows and is, you know, is, is e-flows around 20% of annual flow? Uh, do you have any quick comment on uh, uh, environmental flows? Okay, so so from the water accounting perspective, um, yeah, EMI has derived an, an environmental flow calculator um, and we use the outputs from then from there. Um, there, is, there are standard recommendations, but for in situations like the example that I gave, um, where the basin is home to an ecologically significant ecosystem with um, stakeholder defined environmental flows, then when we're doing the water accounts, we actually derive uh, the, the recommendations based on, on those values. Um, Luna, over to you in case um, you also have a response on the e-flows. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Lisa. I'm having some problems with my internet connection. It's a little bit unstable. I'm sitting in Germany, so which is yeah a little bit embarrassing. But um, uh, yeah, is environmental flow? I, I couldn't hear earlier, but um, the question is about environmental flows. Um, so yeah, environmental flows still haven't been um, incorporated in policy in Nepal. They they still are working with this 10% of low flows, which isn't really, um, you know, it's not really environmental flows, but there's a lot of push now also from ADB and a lot of other organizations to, um, uh, yeah, highlight the importance of environmental flows. And IMI has done quite a lot of work in that in Nepal. We've developed an app, Environmental Flow Calculator, specifically for Nepal. Uh, and, uh, you know, as Lisa said, IMI has developed this um, environmental flow calculator based on hydrology. But in Nepal, actually also under this project, we took this environmental flow calculator, uh, which IMI had developed previously, and added um, 
ecosystems, um, you know, because that was the main um, critique with this environmental flow calculator we had. It didn't have information on ecology and, uh, yeah, the aquatic ecosystem. So we incorporated that and developed this uh, other tool. And this case, this is also available for use. Yeah, so so with that, I think those, that was the, the main clarifier there. Just as a transition into... Um, uh, okay, so thank you, uh, Luna. And yeah, so just as a transition, there's already a lot of interesting questions in the chat box that I'm uh, started to package, and I'll share those more broadly to to trigger some discussion. But I just wanted to, you know, quickly recap the three presentations and and look for links to uh, Asian Development Bank and the focus there on on the WEF. So uh, in conversations with Yele, I think in preparation for this, one of the things that was highlighted is um, there's there's a need to measure measure how WEF projects are and how strongly they cover the WEF nexus. So we thought through the focus on these three aspects today, we were covering three critical sides of, of what needs to be done. So, you know, Kahramon started us out with a very specific example from Central Asia, where, you know, improved irrigation efficiency led to improvements in, 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 uh, in energy use or reductions there. So there's cross-sectoral uh, synergy and impact that was a real positive. I think we also learned from that, though, that drew on in situ data, and there may be limits to scaling that. And I think that's where some of the uh, work that Lisa was describing would come in. Uh, it noted some of the comments are already flagging, and that's interesting. There's different ways to do water accounting, different remote sensing products. You need to account for those things as, as you're utilizing the, the technology. But nonetheless, it, it would allow us to broaden I think from kind of specific areas where there is in, in situ data to broader geographies that may have different data or no data. So there's, I think that's that's where water accounting can come in and support uh, WEF. And then the final example, um, looking at that, reading the first bullet here was around hydroeconomic modeling and IWM, coupling those two with uh, basically with stakeholder engagement and input to arrive at uh, different scenarios and pathways for the future. And ultimately, can, those can inform planning processes. So, you know, linking it with some of the discussion on ADB, um, we were thinking maybe these could be critical aspects of successful uh, WEF projects. Potentially, there's more aspects that can be considered. Um, so perhaps as we transition into the discussion, um, we could keep that in the back of our mind and um, people would be welcome to uh, offer, offer thoughts thoughts uh, in relation to that. Nonetheless, as we jump back to the chat, uh, there were a range of interesting questions. Uh, Kahramon, we haven't heard from in a while. And I thought there was quite a few, quite a few at the beginning, Kahramon, that, uh, that, that were, were relevant to you. So just jumping onto those, I mean, there were, there were three there that I thought clustered quite well together. You know, Stephanie Pierce asked, improving agricultural practices is crucial considering high water use. However, what about an overall systems approach for water effectiveness? That was one about this broader systems approach. In, very much in the same vein, there was another question around uh, policy initiatives in Uzbekistan linking irrigation and energy. And then similarly, there was another question, Takeshi Ueda was asking, not specific to Uzbekistan, but same question broadly, about interministerial coordination. Any any good practices in inter interministerial coordination? So maybe, uh, Kahramon, I could throw that one to you and you could offer some thoughts on systems approach for water effectiveness, policy initiatives and interministerial inter coordination. Thank you, uh, jo uh, Jonathan, uh, and thank you for uh, those questions. Uh, actually, I think uh, system approach would help, you know, to improve water energy use efficiency at the uh, sub-basin level, at national level. Uh, we have here considered mostly on-farm water management practices, but we can also look at, you know, uh, for example, I already mentioned that there is outdated infrastructure, for example, outdated pumps, you know, which consumes huge amount of energy. And uh, I think uh, if we link uh, improving, uh, if we link, you know, uh, if we focus on improving irrigation efficiency from basin, uh, from on farm level to basin scale, I think they will be a lot, uh, it will bring multiple benefits and uh, improve sustainable resource use efficiency uh, in the irrigated agriculture. And regarding uh, second uh, question, like uh, improving intersectoral cooperation, I think uh, quantifying, you know, actually in many cases, uh, this uh, agriculture, 
uh, water and energy sectors uh, looked, you know, uh, uh, in isolated way. So I think uh, making quantified analysis, you know, and showing benefits of, you know, with Nexus based decisions or with Nexus based evidence based solutions, I think will bring uh, stakeholders to the table and discuss, you know, and uh, I think it will be useful also decision makers. The problem is that there is very less quantified methods applied in WEF Nexus in Central Asian countries. So if we quantify benefits, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, if we provide integrated solutions, water land management solutions in irrigated agriculture, I think it will, you know, bring uh, stakeholders to the table and discuss, you know, investment projects. And also it will be, in my opinion, helpful to development partners in the region to focus on, you know, uh, investment projects, you know, whether we have to focus on, you know, rehabilitation or whether we have to focus on policy issues or we have to focus on uh, on farm water management practices. So I think Nexus will, you know, steer such kind of discussions uh, in order to, uh, you know, improve intersectoral cooperation. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, on there's that specific issue around examples of interministerial coordination. You can elaborate, or I might also throw this to Luna. I kind of question whether that uh, example from Nepal may have some good uh, evidence in there. Um, on interministerial coordination, Luna, would you want to offer any thought on that one? Um, yeah. As I mentioned right at the beginning, you know, I mean, conceptually, this um, WEF Nexus approach, of course, it makes sense. And I tell everyone, um, the higher level you go, the more difficult it becomes. So at household level, everyone is thinking in a WEF Nexus approach. So I pay my water bill, electricity bill, and I'm thinking of managing it efficiently. But the higher level you go from provincial to national, it becomes more and more difficult because different ministries have their different mandates and agendas. And so so um, it's not easy. However, I mean, from Nepal, um, one example is when when there are. Um, <laughs> you know, if there are uh, possibilities for synergy, then ministries will work together. And one success story is from Nepal, where the Ministry of Energy and Irrigation, they've now merged uh, to form a water resources ministry. And um, so hopefully, and, and because of that, now a lot of, at least the irrigation and hydropower, will, you know, will have uh, joint investments. Uh, so yeah, that's, it's, it's not easy, but, you know, of the, the it is moving towards <laughs> but but the problems are when there are trade-offs uh, especially with the environmental group i mean it's still very polarized in every any country i've worked in uh, environmental mandate you know preserving ecosystem integrity and development hydropower irrigation is still a very polarized discussion yeah, good. Okay. And just a, a couple cents from my side. I mean, I, I think, you know, where I'm based in Southern Africa, um, there's been discussions that have emerged along those lines. And I, I think the message coming through at times is there's a need to balance process and product. And that, you know, there's, there's some, there's at times concern that added coordination brings added process and uh, kind of a, um, an emphasis on making it focused and um, goal oriented if that's going to be undertaken. So, but it's ultimately good, but you have to be careful not to overdo it. So um, interesting balance to, to strike there. Um, maybe I'll direct uh, a couple of questions to Lisa. There were a couple deeper ones emerging from uh, your presentation. I guess one around, um, there's two, there are two threads that I think are interesting. One around water and energy accounting in the trans in transboundary inter basins with increasing food security the exact question is are there examples of simultaneous water accounting conducted in a trans in transboundary river basins with increasing food security in east africa or elsewhere so there was one on that would, and then there was another one on on water quality because i i things it seems like the the presentation was quantity focused so would you offer uh, would you like to offer thoughts on either of those uh, threads lisa yeah, sure. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, in terms of the simultaneous um, water and energy, I'm not aware of any. There's hydro not hydroeconomic modelling that has has uh, been undertaken, particularly in um, southern Africa, for specific basins. But it doesn't focus. It brings in some energy aspects, but it's 
possibly not as compre comp comprehensive um, as what you're looking for. In terms of the water quality, I think it's, it's a really good point. And within the water accounting framework, we do currently try to incorporate um, as much as possible, which at this moment is um, grey water information um, for a particular basin. And that actually um, some of the indicators I, sh I showed were actually just a few of a much broader set. Uh, which then partition further into looking at in terms of what is usable what then is actually usable based on quality but it's not at the level that we would ideally have it um, this is a, a rapidly improving field in remote sensing but again it's limited to the larger larger rivers and lakes so it's it's one of those um, parameters where it really can only be addressed effectively by in situ networks and um, yeah, from the locations where we've worked, that that's definitely not something that is being as exp being expanded as rapidly as it needs to be. But yeah, I, I do um, note and emphasize the point and agree with it very much that um, it is an important area to to incorporate uh, into the water resources assessments. Um, yeah, just just on this water quality, I mean, basically the value of water also depends on the quality, not just quantity. And so I think that's something we should really push for because in all of our assessments, we always, we I mean, myself as well, we limit ourselves to availability or quantity, but not quality, but we really need to incorporate quality as well. Yeah, good. Uh, and so, uh, agreed, totally. And then Lisa, another word that was in that question, and I think it was in another one was transboundary and I know that's come up in separate discussions would you want to like add any comment on the role of water accounting in transboundary basin specifically yeah maybe just to note that um, th this type of approach the water accounting plus it really is um, set up for larger basins and transboundary basins in particular um, locations where it's difficult to get um, consistent and coherent data um, particularly across borders because of the remote sensing data and the nature of the other input data sources. Uh, we, that the biases are consistent, the data are available even across borders. So it is particularly suited for looking at transboundary basins. Good, yeah, I totally agree. Common approach there, uh, common data. I've worked in transboundary basins where you can spend years arguing about the data um, so that that's a nice way to overcome that. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of questions, I, I think at least three around access to the presentations and sources. And so the presentations are going to be put online, as I understand. And then to my knowledge, at the end of each presentation, there's a set of sources that that, you know, are relevant to this work. So there's a lot of questions around that. And so that that's just to clear that one up. Luna, maybe I'll send one your way. Abraham Daniel asks, how are these development pathways made with stakeholder engagement? Like, how is that if we want to drill down a bit there? Um, he's asking, is there a standardized way to do it? Do you want to elaborate on your process there, how, how there was path, how stakeholders informed the scenarios and pathways? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Actually, this was the most uh, interesting part of the whole project. I mean, we had uh, various ways of stakeholder engagement, as I had mentioned. One of them was we conducted a series of visioning workshops at the national level uh, and provincial level. Level. And in these visioning workshops, uh, we included uh, people from, you know, uh, stakeholders from the government, the private sector, the, you know, people, NGOs, you know, supporters of the environmental sector, as well as, um, you know, civil society. It was, it was very nice. And basically, we just, you know, it was a very simple agenda. We also distributed surveys within these workshops and basically asked them, what is the vision? What is your vision for the currently based in, in 50 years. I mean, what would you want to see? And it was very interesting to see the different kinds of responses we got. I mean, it was really, I mean, you could divide it, you know, the responses from the national level and versus the local level. It was very different. You know, from the national level, the Karnali region, it's, it's you know, it's viewed as poor and underdeveloped and, you know, all that. Whereas the people from the basins themselves, they didn't view themselves uh, as that you know their vision was yeah where we have so much potential we can uh, develop our basin for tourism we have we can do uh, agro um 
develop it for you know like these um, herbs and spices we have a link to India we can market it to China it was like completely different as well. and so that's yeah so this is just summarizing how we went about it so we had we, we had these visioning workshops we conducted surveys and then we also had um, you know this household survey where we went then really down to the local level yeah yeah we're getting down to about five five minutes or so remaining but there is a question and I see a good engagement from Tarwa from RSS asking, and I think there's already some reactions there. And it sounds like Tarwa is in Jordan, where water resources are very limited. So the energy is, sector is suffering. Irrigation percentage is greater than 50%. So I, I guess uh, more than 50% of water is used in irrigation in a highly stressed you know, arid environment there. And, and, and Tarwa is looking for successful examples of integration of WEF nexus and agriculture or water development plans. And I did see some reactions there, but maybe I will give Kahramon a first crack if you would like to offer some thought on this one. Thank you for the question, Tarwa. Yes, uh, actually, Uzbekistan is also considered, you know, semi-arid region, dry region, and all crops must be irrigated. I think, you know, uh, our results within the framework of this project indicated that, you know, improving on-farm water management, uh, you know, practices is uh, crucial for improving water energy use efficiency, specifically in pump irrigated areas. But of course, we also need uh, some institutions, policies and economic incentives for water users, you know, so that they adopt this kind of improved irrigation practices. And uh, in order to uh, IMI has done a lot of work on water energy food nexus, not only in Central Asia, in India, also solar power irrigation uh, in India, also considered one of the good example. And uh, yeah, it, uh, these practices could be replicated to dry areas in order to improve irrigation efficiency and crop productivity. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so as as we're nearing the last 10 minutes here, I'll thank Karamon. I think that was a good good response. And you know, from my side, I think the engagement has been uh, has been quite good in terms of the 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 reactions going around. Yeah, Tarwa has just responded good. Yeah, and if I'm just trying to pick up some some broader threads that are emerging on this, I mean I, I think there's there seems to be real interest for like a kind of a compendium of examples. I, I see that coming through repeatedly for how to do this better, how to, you know, uh, implement the WEF Nexus. We hope in this webinar we've hit on this. You know, we think the example in Uzbekistan is a great example, but I mean, clearly you can't just replicate that directly everywhere. So, so like a compendium of experiences that would form part of a toolbox to inform uh, future efforts to implement WEF Nexus. I think what I'm kind of gleaning from these reactions is that would be excellent. Uh, an excellent thing to develop so that uh, it can be drawn on and, and ADB and others could could implement it. Yeah, I do want to keep us to time and I see we're about eight minutes uh, to go. So and, and so the remaining portions of this, uh, we're, we're going to hand over to Stefan Olenbrook to provide just some synthesis and some lessons that he, he he's kind of picking up from some of the discussion and then Yele will, will close. So, um, so with that, I think... Um, I'll hand to Stefan with the just quick note that you're welcome to follow up with any any of us that presented. The, I'll repeat that the presentation should be online. So if you wish to, to, to access them, you can find them there. And uh, we hope this is the start of a conversation, not the end. So, okay, thanks. Stefan, over to you. Oh, th thanks, Jonathan. And, and thanks to all the presenters. That, that was very interesting. And, and I was asked in the next two or three minutes to, to provide a synthesis, and that, that's difficult. And if I may, because there are so many different aspects that we touched on this afternoon. If I may start with, with the starting point that when Yella introduced the, the seminar today, and I think in other words, he, he and, uh, said that WEF Nexus is often seen as a way to, as a more integrated approach to deal with the environmental pressures that are out there. And, and th certainly that is true. There's a number of different environmental pressures and, and a more integrated approach with considering water, food and energy together, it's, it's, a, it's a better way to deal with the pressures and find synergies. But it's more than that. Huh? It's also kind of becoming more resilient. It's um, becoming um, uh, developing to more, more sustainable development, also prosperity and growth is a very important aspect of, of the WEF Nexus. So it's the environmental, but also the social and the economic pressure that can really help, that we can really address with the WEF Nexus approach. 
When we uh, recently put together a blog that Jonathan was actually um, leading on our side on, on the, the, it's crunch time for the Nexus, we called it, I think. And we were looking to the literature and we found more than 8,300 papers written about the WEF Nexus. But these are largely academic papers, paper, like written by, by people um, discussing it as, an, as, as a great idea, discussing WEF Nexus um, with, with occasionally some, some uh, ground truthing here and there, or some real world uh, examples. But overall, the, the amount of papers that we could find that really focus on implementation uh, was actually very limited. So there's a lot of, uh, was just said in the discussion, uh, we, we should have a compendium or a kind of a resource that help us to to summarize these implementations. And, and I think that that is that's missing and that that came out clearly this afternoon. On the other hand, we, we had three very nice examples from um, Luna, Lisa, and Kakramon. And uh, it was refreshing to see that uh, next water is, is still a central uh, part of the nexus. And that's maybe also the strengths, but also a bit the weakness that often we, we very much come from, from water management. And we look at the WEF nexus, how can we optimize benefits of water use in other sectors? But we're not really in a fully integrated in a kind of um, interactive way, looking at the same time at the energy and the food sector. So it's, it's a bit water centric. And, uh, but if it, it was refreshing. Kakramon this afternoon, he just showed us example that he not only looked at the efficiency in water use and the water savings they could uh, implement there, but he also looked at the um, uh, kilowatt hours, you know, the, the energy savings. He looked at the greenhouse gas emissions and calculated that and looked at different options, uh, how, how this all links together. And, and I believe this, this kind of different perspective, so not only the water management aspect, uh, perspective is very important to fully utilize the utility of water nexus. How to measure that, that, that I think came, came uh, through also very clearly. So we, we, we maybe have as hydrologists or water managers, our tools, others look at, at energy efficiency and other aspects, but how to, in an integrated way, measure and assess it um, remains difficult. There, there's, no, there's no trick, I'm afraid. And we also have to keep it simple. And, and the advantages of the work that, for instance, Lisa uh, introduced this afternoon on water accounting, and she, she and her colleagues increasingly work with standardized data, data cubes to, to speed up and make comparable data available to, to, to be able to also in transboundary context to, to base it on the same uh, source of data. And, and you really coming from, from that side, really making improvements improvement to speed up the process, but also to have comparable and reliable data um, sources. Th that really helps to, to assess um, the, the water component of that. And obviously that is linked to the others. Um, in the fully integrated way, how to measure that remains a challenge, if I may say so. One more point, which also came out in the discussion, I feel some presenters uh, spoke about uh, on farm uh, activities. I think Kakramon mentioned that. And then there was also the demand to have a more, a larger, more systems view on it, an integrated view. And um, it, it became clear that that's what is needed. And water use efficiency is a complete different one if we look at an irrigated field versus if we look at a basin. And that's clear. But also there's different actors. There's new actors. There's different policies, laws, administrative boundaries, objectives of or, uh, author uh, of actors and drivers behind it, um, they're also changing with scale. So having that system approach is, is not the same trick that works on this uh, farm level, but, but a new sort of complexity is introduced, which we need to deal and manage at larger scales. I'm sure there's many more very valuable things that I cannot man, uh, summarize in my five minutes, but thanks again. I found it very entertaining. The good news is that uh, these presentations can all be, uh, will all be uploaded at Development Asia, also the recording of the seminar. And uh, we're looking forward to continue the discussion. Now I would like to hand over to Jelle to, uh, to close this session. Thank you very much. Very much, everybody, for, for I think, a fascinating uh, series of presentation, a very well-led discussion and, and, and nice conclusions that we had. Uh, I, I enjoyed it very much. I hope our colleagues uh, all as well. Um, Karamon, especially to you, I think it's, it, it was very nice to see one of the very few practical studies that we've had on the connection between energy and, and water and the irrigation. And, and I think your, your presentation shows how it's a very simple measure of, of better scale scheduling, we can do a lot. I'd read about it. It's very nice to see it uh, pre presented today. Lisa, we, we talked a lot about uh, water accounting already together, and I think you, you gave a nice presentation on how to, to make it really practical within these, these various trade-offs that, that, that we have. And, and Luna, thank you for, uh, for the, the, the case study, I think, from um, Nepal, and, and particularly also 
the mentioning of how in Nepal there is this process of the ministry that they're slowly joining forces and, and energy and, and water and irrigation be, being planned together to some extent. And I'm somehow proud that, that ADB is, is in some way supporting this, this process, not only there, but in, in many different uh, countries we're doing that by, by support to, to policies and, and looking together how we can improve this nexus. And I think it's, it's important that it is recognized in, a, in our strategy 2030. And I hope we can continue discussions on this. And just to my colleagues from ADB, I would like to, to invite us to further discuss how we can actually look at quantification of this, this water, food and, and energy security, because we have positive, negative and maybe neutral type of measures that we have. But, but how do we actually define that in, in a practical way? And I think that there's a bit more that we can do. And that can help us also in forming projects that are, are much more resource friendly and therefore eventually environmentally friendly, which is which is so important as a task for us. Thank you very much to put this different perspective on it. Once again, Mel, uh, you see it in the chat as well. Uh, the, the presentations are available. Thank you to everybody. And please, let's continue the discussion uh, through through email, through through all kinds of uh, ways that we can, uh, we can communicate together these days. And it's a bit easier with this digital and uh, virtual meetings that we have. Thank you. And I would like to, uh, to end it uh, over here. Hope to see you all soon again. Thanks for the fantastic discussion and the good, great ideas. Bye to everybody.